Yeah, like, like this? Is that too loud? Is this good? Yeah? This? Yeah? All right, let's do this. Yeah. That's Ando. Kuya, bite back. Oi, Nell, keep up with the fuck. The people of Bataan witness most of the men marching meet the butt of a bayonet. Gillian, find Marites and Agapito now. Ando, we're getting help. Nell, get up. You have to get slick. Most of them. Ando already had the pleasure a couple weeks back on Corregidor Island. He and the other USA FFE guerrillas had evaded all the camouflaged Japanese soldiers by disappearing into the ground. The network of tunnels beneath the surface was great for eluding enemies, but with five sets of eyes hunting, the ruse only lasts for so long. His captors stripped him of his weapons and valuables before corralling him with the other 75,000 Filipino and American prisoners. Unless they wanted to be treated like the lucky few, as the guards called the dead, Ando and his comrades had to walk. Ando may have considered himself lucky a month ago. After starting the year in Bataan to bulwark the defenses of the peninsula, Ando caught wind of the next incoming attack and his troop was ordered to go to Corregidor Island. Bataan fell while Ando and his team snuck their way into the next encampment, eating beetles and drinking swamp water along the way. Malaria took its toll on his peers, but Ando evaded harm, capture, and sickness. Three months later, his luck would end and he would reunite with most of his comrades as they marched side by side. The dominion the Japanese had on Southeast Asia was painfully apparent while the hot, humid air weighed down the spirits of those watching. Marchers' heads seemed to jump off of their shoulders, hitting the ground and rolling from side to side between the lines of prisoners trudging through the crimson mud. A canteen of water thrown from the crowd lining the path fell into the hands of an alert captive. He cradled it in his bloodied arms and no more than unscrewed the top when the aluminum flask was snatched from his trembling hands. The officer poured the remaining water in his horse's feeding pouch, threw the canteen down for a heavy hoof to flatten it, and stomped amongst the prisoners to confiscate any water they thought they could have. Ando felt the oppressive sun pummel each inch of his bare skin, his stamina evaporating faster than his sweat. The well ran dry for the men in the group ahead. They collapsed by twos and threes, clouds of dust billowing with each fall. Ando closed his eyes as he passed, but he could not ignore their dry moans and strangled breathing as they tried to hoist themselves back into motion. He looked up to see a handful of his captors walk in the opposite direction, Snapping his head forward before he became another example for his colleagues, Ando flinched at the sudden retitat of pistol and rifle fire. Twenty miles out of Babanga, he had seen every way to mutilate someone with a bayonet. He memorized an entire list of ways to be out of line and deserving of punishment. He was numb to almost everything. His eyelids fluttered as he languidly glanced through the crowd. Heat waves marbled the faces of the Filipinos darting about, trying to com communicate with him. He couldn't hear them. The ringing hen subsided since the last cleanup. Thwok. Sleepy? You want sleep? Just lie down on road. You get good long sleep, laughed the guard in broken English as he wiped the blood and sweat off his pistol. Ando swung his head as blood rolled down his neck. The blow was excruciating, he was sure, but he didn't have the energy to process the pain. His vision still blurry from impact, Ando squinted at the crowd and saw a woman whose long ebony hair was tangled around the rosary in her hands. Gloria. Ando whispered, unsure if she would even hear his parched voice through the clamor. Yet she knowingly nodded and walked at the same pace as her beloved. 
Ando, while her worried hands found the next Hail Mary. Suddenly, Gloria's glance shifted behind Ando and her eyes widened in horror. A salt and pepper haired woman threw her hands into the air as a sign of surrender. No, please, that's my daughter. Ando's heart burrowed into his stomach. Seconds ticked like boulders as he whipped his head to the commotion behind him and saw with unfortunate clarity a small baby flying in the air. Schlick. Blink. Ando watched the blurs of the guards around him over the wailing, rush over to the wailing woman, the Japanese men drowning her cries with their own diminutive banter. Ando! Blink. Ando was swallowed into the crowd like a dragonfly into a frog's mouth. Gloria poured water on Ando's head while her sisters peeled off his once white tank and rimmed apart his ragged fatigues. Ando, run, Gloria whispered, her words urgent and laced with hope. Ando's eyes refocused to meet hers, and in that moment, he considered himself truly lucky once again. Blink. Naked as the day he was born, Ando was hoisted up and he began barreling his way out of the rear of the crowd. Darting around the thatched bamboo walls of town, bobbing and weaving through cornfields and tearing through sugarcane, emerging from the thick, Ando came across a clearing of rice fields and splashed through them, sending water sparkling through the air as the bright sun sought to evaporate the droplets mid-flight. The relief of the water washing over him almost made Ando forget about the blood still running down the back of his neck. Though the rice paddies were refreshingly cool, and though he didn't see a single soul tending the fields, Ando couldn't shake the fear of being found by the wrong person. The canopy of the jungle ahead of him swayed almost as if it was beckoning him to take shelter in its shade. With his feet covered in loose mud, Ando pulled himself from the water and hurtled into a bush at the foot of the jungle. When Ando came out the other side, the bush's outstretched rootstock to welcome him to by grasping his ankle, and the ground rose to meet his face. Fueled by adrenaline and driven by fear, Ando gathered himself while trying not to lose speed. There was no solace to look back and see if there was anything to run from at all. After six hours, all bushes looked the same. Ando saw less and less in front of him. Night was falling and the dense treetops formed a ceiling of shadows. His stomach harmonized with the residents of the jungle singing to the stars. Ando kicked himself for not grabbing a cane to gnaw on before he escaped. In this darkness, there was no telling what was around him to give him some energy. Maybe, he thought to himself, I should set up camp and forage for... <gasps> Ando gasped as his next step didn't touch ground and sent him rolling down a steep bank peppered with jagged rocks and rough roots. His fall was punctuated with an echoing thud, and suddenly Ang Ando could see the stars. They slowly danced in the darkness as Ando's eyes rolled to the back of his head. The jungle helped him find his camp for the evening and insisted he rest. <sighs> The morning sun rose and illuminated the sweat still beating on Ando's naked body. A young macaque waddled over and curiously probed Ando before using his stomach as a trampoline. It was only until the primate jumped on his face that Ando wake up in a panic, sending the curious creature down the path that wound out of the basin. He gathered himself as quickly as he could, but the lack of nourishment and the hydration added extra weight to his limbs. Hoping that his friend was a sign from God, he trudged after the macaque. His stomach grumbled and his tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. His whole body throbbed and he could feel his head begin to dizzy itself. He felt himself lose consciousness when a familiar voice came along. Ando, run! His heart plummeted at the thought of those being the last words he heard from Gloria. Her, but her words rang like a mantra of hope in Ando's head. He picked up speed as he sped down the serpentine path nature carved for him. His vision began to blur, but light was streaming ahead of him. Ando grasped for it as if he could grab onto the light and pull himself, but he could only manage to rip leaves from the palms surrounding him. He leaned against a tree trunk and his head spun. 
With one final leap, he spat himself out of the forest and crumbled into a ball on dry earth laced with large, sprawling vines. Ando struggled to look at his surroundings, his vision fading in and out of clarity. His stomach voiced its opinion and his throat punished him for his neglect. About a yard ahead in his line of sight, Ando saw a familiar, familiar pattern. A watermelon the size of a basketball was wrapped in the greenery. Ando moved to stand, but his well finally ran dry and his energy was fleeting. Grabbing onto a healthy vine in front of him, Ando dragged himself toward the melon. His mouth begged to water as sweat rolled down his head and neck, stinging the wound on the back of his skull. When he came close to the melon, he spent the last ounce of strength in him to rocket his fist through the thick, hearty rind. He removed his hand, now blushed with pink flesh and dripping with juice. He dug his other mud-crested hand into the succulent center and brought his spoils to his lips. The deep red sweetness danced along his tongue, but the sun's relentless heat nauseated him. Ando spat the pink flesh he swallowed onto the ground before rolling onto his side as consciousness escaped him once more. Ando, Ando, Kuya Ando, hello. Bangalang, Kuya Ando, wake up. A carabao snuffed into Ando's face, her bell ringing directly into his ear. She stomped her hooves, which stirred the dust on the earthen floor around him. Ando took a strained breath in and wheezed himself back to life. Ando opened his eyes to a thatched roof and the sight of a beer-bellied man with a snaggletooth smile sitting on the floor across the room from him. I, Sus Mary Joseph, you're okay, the man said, throwing his weight forward to help him get to his feet. You're a day glorious man, right? We thought you died. Well, you would have died if I didn't find you here. The man handed him a cup of water from a bucket, and Ando didn't hesitate to guzzle it down. Where am I? He asked, wiping the water on his lips all over his grimy face. My farm, Ando. Don't know how you got here, because I usually have to ride a horse to get to Batayan. There was a silence as Ando tried to understand how this man can be so casual with war a couple towns away. Let me get you that watermelon you crushed. That fruit saved your life, eh? Was the best you ever tasted, or what? The man chuckled as he ran out the door. He returned with a crushed melon in his calloused hands. With the juice running down his forearms, he unloaded the fruit onto the floor next to Ando. Eat up, Kuya. Never leave a plate half full, because you never know if that meal will be your last. Thank you.